Welcome to Music History Monday for October 24th, 2022. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Carl Ruggles. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. Before moving on to Carl Ruggles, the featured composer of today's post, we would offer the warmest of happy birthdays to one of the most brilliant composers of the 20th century, who also happened to be one of the nicest human beings I've ever met, George Crumb. He was born in Charleston, West Virginia on October 24th, 1929, 93 years ago today, and died at his home in the Philadelphia suburb of Media, Pennsylvania, on February 6, 2022, at the age of 92. I offered up an appreciation of Crumb in my Music History Monday post on the occasion of his 87th birthday on October 24, 2016. We will revisit Crumb in my Music History Monday and Dr. Bob Prescribes posts for March 13 and 14, 2023. Ah, yes, I plan ahead when we tackle his Black Angels for Electric String Quartet. On to the featured event for today's post. We mark the death on October 24, 1971. 51 years ago today, of the American composer, teacher, and painter Charles Sprague Carl Ruggles in Bennington, Vermont. Born in Marion, Massachusetts on March 11, 1876, Ruggles was 95 years old at the time of his death. Sea Level People Ordinarily, when we refer to C-level people, and that's C with the letter C and not S-E-A, when we refer to C-level people, we are talking about those people who constitute the upper echelons of a corporation's senior executives and managers. C means chief, and such C-level individuals include the CEO, chief executive officer, CFO, Chief Financial Officer, COO, Chief Operating Officer, and CIO, Chief Information Officer. Now, much as I'd love to discuss the leadership issues and workforce empowerment challenges faced by such C-level or C-suite executives, we'd observe that there's another sort of C-level people Folks who are, by their nature, crusty, curmudgeonly, cantankerous, crabby, cranky, and cross. Let us now get a bit more specific. Let's talk about C-level composers. By the way, this isn't to say that the individuals on the following list of C-level composers didn't have good reason to be the way they were, that they didn't have hearts of gold and various saving graces, and that they weren't capable of the warm and fuzzies, just that on a day-to-day basis they could be crotchety. Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770-1827, Giuseppe Verdi, 1813-1901, Johannes Brahms, 1833-1897, Charles Ives, 1874 to 1954, and Carl Ruggles, 1876 to 1961. Those people in the know will wonder why I didn't put the American composer David Diamond, 1915 to 2005, on this C-level composers list a truly wonderful composer whose Symphony No. 2 was featured in my Dr. Bob Prescribes post on May 21, 2019, David Diamond, bless him, crossed the line from being just a curmudgeon 
to a genuine douchebag. Sorry, but that's just how he was. Neither is Richard Wagner on my C-level composer list. See David Diamond above. Karl Ruggles, he changed his first name from Charles to the German equivalent of Karl out of his love for things German, was of that generation of American modernists, which included his friend, Charles Ives, who were bound up in a dissonance equals machismo thing. Born in New England, as was Ives, in 1876, Ruggles grew up at a time when real American men weren't professional musicians, a career considered fit only for foreigners and effeminates. The result was an overcompensating, exaggerated machismo on the part of both Ives and Ruggles, both of whom felt that purposely pretty music, like that of Debussy, for example, was the compositional equivalent of a limp handshake. Instead, they each cultivated edgy, chromatic music that, in their own minds, reinforced their masculinity. A telling story. On January 10th, 1931, a concert was held at New York's Town Hall. Conducted by Nicholas Slomninsky, the concert was underwritten by Ives, who was a wealthy C-level insurance executive to the tune of $1,500, the equivalent of over $29,000 today. Among the works on the program was the premiere of Ives's Three Places in New England and a performance of Carl Ruggles's Men and Mountains. We will allow Ives himself, writing here in third person, to describe what happened at the concert. Quote, At this concert, he, Ives, sat quietly through the boos and jeers at his own music. But when that wonderful orchestral work, Men and Mountains, of Carl Ruggles was played, a sound of a disapproving hiss was heard near him, again near Ives. Ives jumped up and shouted, you god darn sissy eared molly coddle, when you hear strong masculine music like this, stand up and use your ears like a man, and don't flibby faint over backwards. Unquote. Carl Ruggles, Biography. Again, he was born on March 11, 1876, in Marion, Massachusetts, on Buzzards Bay, near Cape Cod. Again, he lived a long life dying 51 years ago today in 1971 at the age of 95. Some perspective. At the time of his birth, Ulysses S. Grant was President of the United States and General George Armstrong Custer's death at the Battle of Little Bighorn was still three months in the future. At the time of Ruggles's death, the first moon landing was two years behind us. The President of the United States was Richard M. Nixon, and the Paris peace talks, which would eventually lead to the United States' withdrawal from the catastrophe that was the Vietnam War, were already in their third year. The young Carl Ruggles is described by musicologist Ralph Kirkpatrick as having been, quote, a practical fisher boy and an instinctive fiddler, unquote. An instinctive fiddler is correct. At the age of six, Ruggles built his first fiddle using a cigar box. His mother, who was, we are told, a gifted soprano, sang to him constantly, and it was her repertoire of Stephen Foster songs, folk songs, and church hymns that became young Carl's violin repertoire. He received the gift of a quarter-sized violin from a local lighthouse keeper on which he continued to play by ear. Quote, I began to play hornpipes and gigs by ear. I couldn't read a note. People would come for miles to hear me play those hornpipes. Unquote. In 1885, President Grover Cleveland spent the summer there in Marion, Massachusetts. The nine-year-old Ruggles was at the time in the habit of giving what were called roadside performances. 
Cleveland attended one of Ruggles's performances, during which the First Lady, Rose Cleveland, played a series of duets with the boy. Having learned to read music and acquired a full-sized violin, the teenaged Ruggles moved to Boston, where he played in various theater orchestras. Crusty as always, Ruggles later recalled in particular the Keith Theater Orchestra, quote, they had the feeling to go for the right note, whether it was on the page or not. That's a gift. Compared to the Keith Theater Orchestra, the Boston Symphony men weren't worth a damn." Unquote. It wasn't until his mid-twenties that Ruggles sought out what formal musical education he had, studying violin with a well-known local named Felix Winternitz and composition with Harvard's own John Knowles Payne. In 1906, the now 30-year-old Ruggles married a contralto and choral director named Charlotte Snell. A series of teaching jobs took Ruggles and his family around the country, first to Winona, Minnesota, where both Carl and Charlotte taught at the Mar de Mar School of Music, then to New York City, where Carl met his kindred spirit, Charles Ives, and got involved in the new music scene. Between 1922 and 1933, Mr. Ruggles was active with Edgar Varese in the International Composers Guild and the Pan American Association of Composers. Finally, it was off to Florida, where Ruggles taught at the University of Miami from 1938 to 1943. All the while he composed, albeit slowly, slowly like glaciation, slowly like plate tectonics. In 1943, Ruggles left academia for good and took up residence in a former one-room schoolhouse in Arlington, Vermont. It was there that he painted, at which he was actually quite good, and continued to endlessly rewrite the very few musical compositions he had managed to complete during the previous decades. The composer Henry Cowell, 1897 to 1965, told a most revealing story about Ruggles' trial and error method of composing. Cowell found himself standing outside Ruggles' schoolhouse studio. Why he was standing outside, we do not know. Perhaps he was politely obeying the sign posted by Mrs. Ruggles on the front door. Quote, no admittance. Do not knock until one. Then come in and stay as long as you like. Unquote. While he was standing there, Cowell listened to Ruggles hammer continuously on one, quote, massive piano chord, unquote, for, according to Cowell, at least an hour. On finally being admitted to the schoolhouse slash studio, Cowell asked Ruggles what he was doing with that chord. Ruggles' reply, quote, I was giving it the test of time, unquote. Honors and notice eventually came to Carl Ruggles, but as they all too frequently do, they came too late to be of inspiration. In 1963, at the age of 87, he was elected to the National Institute of Arts and Letters. His masterwork, Sun Treader, completed in 1931 and the subject of tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, was first recorded in 1970 when he was 94. whoop de doo That's just the sort of delayed recognition that can make an old fella cranky, because in fact, recognition delayed is recognition denied. Back to sea level people. According to the American composer and critic Virgil Thompson, 1896 to 1989, Carl Ruggles was, quote, wry, salty, disrespectful, and splendidly profane. He recalls the old hero of comic strips, Popeye the Sailor, never doubtful of his relation to sea or soil, unquote. Donald Hennehan, writing in Ruggles's obituary 
in the New York Times asserted that Ruggles was, quote, small, quick, and wiry. He spoke with an earthiness that shocked many people. He smoked cigars and told dirty stories. He attacked his fellow composers, sneering at almost everyone but Ives. He refused to play the part of the genteel artist." Unquote. Unfortunately, Ruggles's crankiness was more than a lack of gentility. More than just profane, Carl Ruggles was a racist and an anti-Semite. Typical of many artists whose work transcends their often difficult personalities, many people gave Ruggles a pass and looked the other way when it came to his prejudices. For example, in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, we'll observe how the young Michael Tilson Thomas became a great champion of Ruggles' music and even visited him in 1970, the year before Ruggles died. However, had Ruggles known that Thomas was, that he is, a gay Jewish man, that meeting might not have taken place. In a letter to the pianist and composer Henry Cowell, Ruggles went out of his way to abuse the American and Jewish composer Arthur Berger, 1912 to 2003, and then raged about, quote, that filthy bunch of Juilliard Jews, cheap, without dignity, with little or no talent, unquote. There were friends that did break with Ruggles because of his attitudes. One such person was the composer Lou Harrison, 1917 to 2003, who was a close friend of Ruggles's and a protege of Charles Ives. In 1949, a performance in New York of Ruggles's work Angels was followed with a celebratory lunch at a restaurant at Pennsylvania Station. Perhaps Ruggles started drinking, perhaps he did not. What he did do, however, was go on a profane jag during which he began shouting anti-black and anti-Semitic slurs. For Harrison, who was gay, it was a final straw. He walked out and washed his hands of his relationship with Ruggles. Okay, so we acknowledge it. Carl Ruggles was a C-level composer, someone capable of being a first-class creep. But I am honor-bound to point out that not one of us, myself included, want to be remembered for our worst aspects. Certainly, Carl Ruggles was loved and respected by many. The aforementioned Henry Cowell, who spent four years from 1936 to 1940 in San Quentin State Prison on a morals conviction due to homosexual activity, went on the record saying that Ruggles was, quote, irascible, lovable, honest, sturdy, original, slow-thinking, deeply emotional, self-assured, and intelligent." Unquote. In a letter to Ralph Kirkpatrick, Ruggles' only child, a son named Micah, said this about his father, quote, "...very few people understand him and realize that his bark is nothing but spent energy or perhaps a sour note that has escaped." Unquote. Am I being an apologist for a racist and an anti-Semite? Perhaps. But here in our oversensitized and all too quick to condemn present day, I'm also trying to maintain a bit of perspective. And so I would ask, given the times and places of their births, does any one of us really believe that Johann Sebastian Bach Wolfgang Mozart and Ludwig van Beethoven never made a racist or an anti-Semitic statement? Speaking for myself, I'd simply rather not know. Here's my present rationale for dealing with cranks like Carl Ruggles. If he were alive today, I would not be celebrating him by posting about him and his music. That's because someone alive today should know better whereas he was cursed with the baggage of his time. And because he is not alive today, nothing good I say about him can in any way profit or please him. As such, we will not deny ourselves the extraordinary experience of hearing and discussing Ruggles's masterwork, 
Sun Treader, which will be the subject of tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post. Until then, thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.